Welcome to this course uh, called Cracking the Code to Educational Analysis. Now, really what I want to do over here is take you through 10 basic que questions that introduce you into the basic functioning of how education works. The idea is ambitious uh, on the one hand because the aim is for you to be able to take any educational process or event in the world and using these 10 questions get a basic insight into how education actually does work to analyze its mechanisms. Uh, so it is very ambitious. But on the other side, it's really very humble because all it does is points to the inner working mechanisms of education it doesn't get you into the bigger, broader, political, ideological, economic, emotional issues which drive education in all sorts of powerful ways. We will leave that for a separate series to be done after we've actually got through the basics. And it's the basics that are important to me uh, because often we land up asking questions about education without really understanding its inner mechanisms. So 10 questions will get you into the inner mechanisms uh, and this introduction will take you through the basic structure of the 10 questions and also how the, this video series is actually um, constructed. So let's, let's start with the uh, questions 1, 2 and 3 and these are really curriculum questions. They deal with uh, the what of education, they deal with the content that goes into the process of educating our students. Now really over here I want to work with three separate distinctions and it's caught in this um, diagram over here. Number one, question number one, I want to deal with the relationship between everyday experiences and understandings and specialized knowledge on the other side. Now you'll notice that in the drawing of this diagram, what I've got is I've got a, a bunch of solid lines and I've got a bunch of open lines, broken lines. Now these are crucial to the way that the book functions. A solid line is a situation where you clearly separate off um, the two issues so, or the two um, terms, the two concepts, the two functionings. So over here you have everyday experience and if it's a solid line, you separate it off powerfully from specialized knowledge. But many people will also argue and point out to the necessity to integrate everyday experiences with specialized knowledge. They'll argue for an open line between the way that knowledge actually works uh, on the one hand and the way that we experience everyday life on the other. And they will argue that the two need to come together to breathe and give life and shape to each other. Now the first question will enter into the intricacies of that debate and show you how to analyze the relationship between the everyday world and specialized knowledge. Now the second question hones in on the specialized world in its own terms. So what we do is we kind of ratchet the focus up away from the everyday and straight into the specialized. And when we go into the specialized, what we try to understand are the different kinds of specializations that operate and how they relate to each other. Now again, these open and solid lines are really vital to half the picture, to half the story. And that half of the story is separate from each other in which case the line is solid. And we know this from the way that teachers and students operate. Sometimes what you do is you combine subjects together through themes and you ensure that rather than doing each subject in its own right, you work with a combination of subjects together to understand a more complex problem. You integrate the different subjects rather than keep them separated. And you can tell this, you can see this if you actually go into schools. Uh, some uh, subjects are kept very separate from each other. They occur in different classrooms, they have different teachers, they have different identities. In other schools what happens is they try to work with themes and the teachers from the different subjects actually share a common interest in a bigger 
uh, more integrated project. Now the third question ratchets the focus up even more in terms of curriculum. What it does is it goes inside one specialization and starts to interrogate how it works. What are its relationships? Now you can see, for example, with science that you have uh, subsections to science like chemistry and physics. And here again, you can ask the question about whether you combine the two together, integrate them, uh, or you separate them off into clearly different subjects with different books taught at different times. And the same thing happens with English in terms of grammar and poetry, maths in terms of algebra and geometry, and art, for example, in terms of history and practical. Inside the subject itself, you can ask the question about the nature of the boundary between the subsections being open or solid. Now, the first three questions cover curriculum. The next five questions deal with pedagogy. Now, by pedagogy, what we're talking about is we're talking about how the teacher actually teaches and how the learners actually learn together. Now, in terms of the five pedagogy questions, the first three are clearly caught in this diagram over here. Uh, and they follow very logically from each other. When you are going to teach, the first thing that you have to do is work out what it is that you're going to teach in terms of a selection from the curriculum of what it is that you're going to teach. Now, in terms of that, you can have a situation where you only choose one thing to teach. It's a very determined set. And I think you can guess from that 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 would make the boundary uh, solid. Or as a teacher, you could be far more open about what it is that you're going to select. It could be a negotiation with the students. It could be a negotiation with the time of the day, etc., etc., etc. But the point is, is that then you open out the selection to a number of possible choices. But once you've made the selection um, clear, either in terms of it being open or solid, you then have to take that selection and sequence it in a certain way. Now, again, in terms of the sequencing, and that will now be question five, you can either have a solid sequence in which you are crystal clear about the sequence. It goes A, B, C, D, E, F, and that's it. That's the sequence that you have to follow. Uh, solid line. Or what you can do is you can open out the sequence to a number of possible options. You could, you could tell the students, hey, this is the selection that we're going to do for sure. But then you could say to them, I'm not quite sure how you move from point A to point F. Why don't you try and work with the sequence and see if you can find the best sequence that suits you. And you can hear there what you're doing. You're opening the sequence line. Once you've selected and once you've sequenced, well, it then becomes very important to actually pace the lesson, to work out what the time requirements are for the students themselves. And here you can start to hear the mantra. Either the pacing will be solid, in which case you say to the students, you have to do this by this time, that by that time, this by that time, etc., etc., etc. And you give very clear timelines for how it should be done. Other teachers prefer a far more open pacing boundary in which what they do is they're very flexible about uh, the time it's going to take for students to learn because they understand that some students take longer than others. Sometimes you can't predict how long it's going to take and you keep the pacing open to make sure that understanding and meaning is properly done. Now, that gives you a very brief introduction to the first three questions of pedagogy, right? And those would be questions four, five, and six in terms of the book itself. Uh, but notice that in talking about it, I've really only concentrated on the boundary line strength in selection, sequencing, and pacing. I haven't gone into the details about what the mechanisms of selection are about how you actually do sequence things, how a sequence works, and what the actual logics of pacing are. And you'll find in each of the videos uh, that the second half of the video will always go into the details, for example, about downward and emergent selection logics, about how with sequences you, you, you either sequence the content 
or you sequence the connections. And with pacing, how you have to take into account the fact that you're either working with something heavy or something light. So that really takes us through the first three pedagogic questions uh, in, in the book. But once you've worked with selection, sequencing and pacing, you then have to move on to assessment. You have to check that what's done is actually done and you have to use that information as a feedback loop to make sure that you improve on what's being done and you move the student forward. Now, this is indicated very simply by a feedback loop. And what you can see in the feedback loop is you can see you're trying to put something in input X, let's call that the curriculum. And then what happens is you try to land up in a situation where you teach it and there you can see the pedagogy, selection, sequencing and pacing. And that produces a certain output. And what assessment does is checks whether that output is actually up to standard, whether it does what it's required to do. And if it doesn't, you then have a feedback loop where you put the information about what hasn't worked back into the system so that you can improve it the next time. And certainly that you can give the students advice about how their own work needs to improve. So this, this fourth pedagogic question, this question of feedback and assessment is vital to the way that education works. And we'll spend quite a lot of time dealing with this issue in one of the videos. Now, once you have selected, sequenced, paced, and assessed uh, the um, teaching and learning setup, you then land up in a situation where you can take a look at the bigger picture of the relationship between the teacher on the one side and the student on the other side. So the pedagogic question really revolves at its biggest level, I suppose, on what the dynamics are between the teacher and the student. And over here, I've tried to catch us in this gorgeous diagram, which on the one side shows the teacher with the kind of slightly smug look on his face at the top of the, of the, top of the stairs, um, looking down on the student. So on the one side, there's a re relationship of authority where the teacher is in control. But on the other side with teaching, there's always this kind of personal relationship between the teacher and the student where they form some kind of connection. And we're going to try and understand these positional and personal relationships between teachers and students in uh, the uh, eighth question of the, of the book. Now, once we've covered curriculum, questions one, two, three, pedagogy, questions four, five, six, seven, and eight in terms of relationships, the final two questions that we deal with, nine and ten, take us into the bigger picture of how education works. And, and that's in terms of the levels of education and the stages of education. Now, in terms of the levels of education, really I'm going to point to the fact that education has three very basic levels. Uh, right at the top, you have the place where new knowledge is produced, and that, that happens at the higher levels of research institutes, that happens at the higher levels of university. But the issue with that esoteric knowledge, that very difficult new knowledge, is, is that it has to be recontextualized, and it has to be reshaped so it makes sense for learners and teachers down at the classroom level. So when you move from that top level down to the middle level, that middle level refers to the departments of education and the attempts of institutional structures to take that difficult, high-level, new, esoteric knowledge and make it digestible, make it uh, workable for students and learners across a whole country, across schools. So they have to work out ways to reorganize and package the knowledge into a curriculum. And that's the work of the second level. And the work of the third level, that bottom level, is where the teachers and the learners actually engage with the process of doing the teaching and learning of that um, knowledge. And of course, the hope is, is that when they do those basics properly, those are going to be the people that move up and eventually land up in a situation where they produce new knowledge, or at least some of them produce new knowledge. The rest of us will work very hard at reproducing the conditions of our existence. So that gives you a very basic picture 
of the levels of education. And we'll go through that in question 9. And then finally, with question 10, we'll actually take a look at the stages education systems go through. And there I'm going to, I'm going to argue that education systems tend to go from very simple systems where they can only really do one thing at one time in one place in a very simple way. But that education systems evolve, they develop, and eventually they become more complex. And as they become more complex, they are able to do different things uh, in a flexible way, depending on what the situation demands at the time. And that kind of shift from simple to complex systems will be the focus of question 10. Now, that gives you a very quick overview into the nature of this course that you're going to be doing. It's 10 basic questions, which will give you an insight into how education actually functions. And once you master those 10 questions, you will have the basics to do educational analysis. So I hope you enjoy these uh, video lectures. You'll find that you've got 10 questions quite clearly put. Each one of them is going to take you about 10, 15 minutes to work through. I will then attach to each question, each video, a kind of like a working example so that you can spend some time working through the issues and puzzling over the, the problems. So each video will have a sister video which deals with um, a, a concrete example. And what I've also done is I've put in some stitching videos at the end of curriculum to show you how curriculum works as a whole and after pedagogy to show you how pedagogy works as a whole. And then what I've done right at the end is I've given you one summary exercise to do where we analyze South African education using the 10 questions.